Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, indeed, I would like to show you um, a retrospective of some of my work, but also of basically 2,000 years or more of trying to understand the brain and to give you some ideas of the most recent work which is being done on the topic. Um, I am a mathematician who was turned into a psychologist who was turned into a cognitive neuroscientist because these technologies appeared. And basically I'm interested in trying to understand how by looking at the brain we can see the mind. How, what is the connection between in the matter of the brain and the organization of uh, the mind, mental activities, mental processes. So um, the, the topic of today's talk is actually nicely illustrated by this uh, engraving from the 16th century. Uh, it's a person who is entering into an alchemy oven. It is very difficult for us not to imagine that she's being scanned, right? Uh, it looks like a scanner. And out of the oven, they do not come uh, pictures of uh, the brain, but comes pictures of the thoughts of the person. You can see that the person is thinking about music and a woman and a horse and maybe uh, the underpants of the person and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the idea here is uh, really the topic of my talk. Can we scan the brain and get some images of the mind? Can we decipher some mental processes using uh, imaging? For a long time, the only theory was uh, the Hippocratic theory developed by Gallien and spread throughout the antiquity and throughout the Middle Ages, according to which the brain was a hydraulic machine. It was just a metaphor because there was no way of studying how the brain works, basically. So they had this idea already that there was common sense in the front, in the first ventricle. They noticed the existence of these ventricles full of fluid, and they saw this was a fluid machine. This was the only available machine at the time, hydraulic machine. And uh, they figured that the first ventricle was for common sense, the middle ventricle was for cogitation, and the back, of course, the cellar of the brain, was for memory. This was fanciful, but there was no uh, other available metaphor, and there was also no other way to study the brain than to dissect it. And this is an image from Vesalius. I don't know if you've seen this beautiful fabric of the human body, one of the most beautiful uh, work of art, I should say, from dissections of the human body, including the brain. And by looking at the brain, of course, you, there is not much you can say about how it works. It was very hard to guess how this organ was working. But significant progress started when people became uh, interested in the correlation between lesions of the brain and uh, impairments in cognitive functions. What you are seeing here is the brain of a very famous patient, Tantan, Tantan, Tantan. Le Borgne, Mr. Le Borgne was the first patient studied by Paul Broca, which uh, gave his name to Broca's aphasia, as you all know it. And uh, this is Broca's area, of course, the foot of the third frontal gyrus. Uh, you can see the lesion here. And this patient, after his death, uh, was dissected and was able to correlate the uh, site of the lesion with the impairment in speech production. This was the first time that there was the idea that there could be a specific relationship between a specific cognitive function, here the ability to generate, articulate language, and uh, a particular site in the brain. There came the idea also that there could be lateralization of functions, so the left hemisphere seemed to be always the site of the lesions, almost always uh, for aphasia. And this was the beginning of the systematic correlation between brain sites of lesions and uh, psychological syndromes. I, I started in this way uh, more than 35 years ago. We were seeing patients and we were deciding uh, from their symptoms how the uh, psychological processes were organized and where they were occurring in the brain. It was very indirect, of course. We had to wait until this extraordinary image. And for me, this was a revolution. In uh, 1988, 1989, came out several papers from the same team from St. Louis they were able to make the skull transparent. This was now in the living human brain, the ability to look at which areas uh, are metabolically more active 
when you engage in certain psychological processes. This is a work of Mike Posner and Marcus Reichel and collaborators in St. Louis. It was, of course, using positron emission tomography. I don't know if you guys still use PET, probably, for some particular uh, medical conditions, but we were using it for psychology, basically, or for cognitive neuroscience. What you can see here is regions of the brain that are consuming uh, oxygen. The oxygen was labeled as oxygen 15 using a cyclotron in the basement of the uh, facility and uh, was injected or breathed by the patients, by the person. And uh, you can see different labels here corresponding to the type of mental activity that the person was engaged in. Hearing words on the left, seeing the same sort of words, speaking words that you read, and generating verbs that are associated, semantic associates of the words. And you begin to see some lo localization. You can see how primitive it was. This is a group study. We had to average the brain. Th this is where the importance of normalizing the size of the brain came in and Talerac, Jean Talerac, a French uh, uh, neuro neurologist, was able to propose this Talerac frame to uh, squeeze the brains in the same framework. And by averaging several brains, you could get this sort of fuzzy images of where the activity was occurring and very clearly rep replicate the importance of Broca's area, but also the specialization of other areas for specific cognitive functions. It was very difficult to do these studies. I did some of them. We had to have a cyclotron in the basement, generate the radioactivity with a half-life, I think it's one minute 40 seconds, so very short half-life, run through the corridors with a syringe with labeled radioactive water that you had to inject to the person, and you could do one image in 12 minutes. So each image of one person, you could do the same person maybe a number of times, maybe 10 times or 12 times, but each image was 12 minutes minimum. Okay. So very, very slow, difficult experiment. And today, this is a modern image, not so recent, but it's a single person. The voxels are very small in the order of one or two or three millimeters. And this is really extremely detailed psychological processes. This is from the work of Jack Gallant in Berkeley in California and his colleagues. What they are doing here is they are labeling a single brain, who's been, a person who has been many times in a scanner listening to the radio and through sophisticated artificial intelligence techniques they are able to attribute uh, specific words and specific concepts to particular sites on the cortex. So the colors represent different uh, domains of meaning I don't know if you can read, but in red is the social sphere. Uh, in dark green is the number that I will talk about later. And uh, or there, are, there is a sense of space, of body parts, and so on. So each of these voxels have, according to the authors, a specific function in semantic organization of words. And you can see if you click on one of the voxels, this is available online, by the way, if you want to look at it. Uh, the whole atlas and the whole results are available online. And if you click on this particular sorry, if you click on this particular voxel, it's very hard to point, you will see that the preferred words for this area are all words that relate to the social sphere, maybe to other people and their thoughts and their minds and so on. This is the famous temporal parietal junction, which is thought to be involved in theory of mind. So you see the huge jump from uh, one image fuzzy in 12 minutes to an image uh, in fMRI, we can do an image every second or two seconds at the resolution of a few millimeters and get an idea of a single person brain organization. So this is now the place that I direct. It's called Neurospin. It's in the south of Paris, in Saclay, Saclay University. Each of the arches that you can see here, these giant sinusoids, uh, hosts one brain imaging machine. And you see here this giant machine which is arriving. This is the new magnet. This was already some years ago, four, four or five years ago. This is the magnet at 11.7 Tesla. It is the world's biggest magnet. It is now working in your spin. It generated its first images uh, a few months ago. And uh, this is a monster of uh, brain imaging, basically. It weighs 150 tons. It is filled with helium, which has to be super fluid. It has uh, uh, several hundred megajoules of energy, uh, kilojoules, sorry, of energy cycling through it. Anyway, I could go on and on for all of these properties of this magnet, but the goal here is to increase 
the signal that we can get from fMRI and from MRI in general, and therefore to have better, higher resolution images of the brain. One example of things we can do with this new magnet, you can see here some of the first images that were just shown a few weeks ago, and still not published. On the left, you get uh, an, Im an anatomical image of a subject that was scanned at 7 Tesla, and on the right, uh, the same subject was scanned at 11.7 Tesla. And I hope you can see uh, the quality of the image. Already 7 Tesla, which is you know, a commercial machine, um, is much higher quality than the typical 3 Tesla machine that you are probably using, I suppose. I started by using a 1.5 Tesla machine, and it was already interesting. But uh, with the 11.7 Tesla, I hope you can see the amazing level of detail that you can get just from this anatomical image. Uh, you can see uh, in the back of the brain here in the visual areas, some of the layers of cortex are marked by contrast. There is better contrast in general. Um, and uh, you can see also some of the small vessels that are piercing the cortex and are so important in some neurological disease and uh, neurodegenerative disease. I hope you can see also that there is contrast in the basal ganglia and thalamus and uh, we are studying this, but here you can see that we, you, you begin to be able to resolve some of these structures that are otherwise invisible to classic uh, MR. So just from the anatomy side, it's becoming quite interesting to begin to be able to use this machine. We've had, we have had permission to use only 20 subjects on this machine so far, so I cannot show you too much, but we can say already that it's working and that the images are really incredible. And uh, of course, we will be doing more. I can say also that we are very relieved that the 20 subjects were absolutely safe, both from the point of view of uh, inner ear, as well as uh, examination of possible chromosomal anomalies and so on. So we're still in a context where it seems that MR is completely safe and essentially almost neutral with respect to physiological function, which is a great uh, relief. So there will be more images coming from this magnet. We can do anatomies, we can also do diffusion tensor imaging. I'm sure you're familiar with this idea that we can monitor the movement of water molecules. And because the water molecules hit upon the membranes inside uh, the organ here, the brain, we can see the direction in which the membranes are going. And so if we are in white matter, as you can see here, the colors indicate the preferred directions of the movement of the water molecules and they tell us how the white matter is organized, how the fibers are organized. We can track the white matter. And in this ex extraordinary image, a whole brain was imaged at 200 microns resolution at 11.7 Tesla. It's not a live brain, no, it's a post-mortem brain. But we hope to be able to do the same sort of images in the live brain, right? This was post-mortem, small pieces of brains that were scanned in an animal scanner that we also have at 11.7 Tesla. And the pieces were then pieced together on the computer to yield this amazing image. This is probably the, the most detailed atlas of white matter that was ever obtained uh, from a human being. Because this is superior to dissection. You cannot get that from dissection. You have to get it from imaging. So, anatomy, diffusion, but of course the most interesting for us, for me at least, is function. What can we say about the function of the brain? And already uh, using seven Tesla magnets, we can get a lot of single uh, subject detail. I, uh, we study a lot the ventral visual pathway. So this is the brain seen from the bottom. And uh, you can uh, see from the colors some areas that prefer, in a highly selective manner, specific categories. For instance, faces uh, in uh, orange or red, uh, objects in blue, and especially I will be talking about these areas that are in green here, that are responsive to words. Okay, so this is the left hemisphere. I hope you can see it's seen from the bottom. And in the left hemisphere, we see these very clear responses to words. In the middle uh, of other areas that care about specific categories of visual displays. And in rare cases, we can confirm the preference. For instance, you see also this preference for places here, which is well reported in the parahippocampal gyrus. Well, in rare cases, uh, we can confirm the fMRI signal from recordings of uh, you know, single neuron activity. This is beautiful image that was obtained by Florian Mormann of neurons, one neuron in this case, responding in the uh, parahippocampal region, medial temporal lobe. And uh, you can see, I hope you can see that the firing of this neuron uh, 
is occurring every time there is a picture of a landscape or a place or a house, but not if there is a picture of an animal or a person, unless uh, it is in the context of a particular place, like here perhaps the horse is in a specific place. Right? But, uh, so you can see that in rare cases of epilepsy, where it's possible to record from single neurons by inserting electrodes inside the brain, of course we never do that in normal people, but only in very rare patients, then we can see that what we see with fMRI uh, tends to converge very nicely and support what we see uh, with uh, single neuron recordings. And the goal, of course, is to get to the single neuron level. At the moment, in the living, normal human brain, we can only study fMRI, but we hope that these examples like these give us a sort of target and correlation and hope that the fMRI signal is good enough to look at neural activity. Here is another example from the beautiful work of Rodrigo Cui and Quiroga. I don't know if you know this neuron. It's a famous neuron. This is a single neuron in the anterior temporal lobe. And if you look carefully at what makes the neuron fire, just to get you oriented, so each line is one replication. And you can see the spikes of the neuron every time you show this picture. You know this guy? Luke Skywalker. OK. Well, this neuron is responding every time that the person sees or hears about Luke Skywalker. So this is different views of the guy, you know, uh, different movies, different ages. This is seeing the name Luke Skywalker, and this is hearing the name Luke Skywalker. And every time the neuron will fire, and it does not fire to other celebrities. I cut the image, but there are many other tests, and it does not respond to other people, to places, and so on. It responds to a single person, with one exception. Can you see the exception? I think you know this guy. This is Yoda, OK? So why is the neuron responding to Luke Skywalker and Yoda? Nobody knows, right? And this is the limit of these experiments, just very short experiments. Uh, maybe this neuron is responding to all Jedi. We don't know, OK? But at least it shows that there is a nice correlation between concepts and single neuron activity. And that's what we're looking for. We're trying to create this bridge here. So I go back to fMRI because that's what I used, although I also collaborate with surgeons who record like this. And in fMRI, we study specifically what happens when you learn a specific function. And here, the function is reading. We're very interested in understanding how you can acquire a novel function, such as reading, which was not anticipated in evolution. And what you see here is a single subject image at 7 Tesla. We have many images like that. In every single person in this room, if I scan you, and if I flash you some words that you can read, and uh, maybe contrast with other pictures, well, as you can see here, you will see some voxels that respond just to the words. I hope I can point. Yeah, here we go. So uh, here they are, there is the response to words in English and words in French. This is a bilingual person who can read both. And you see this is the voxel response uh, relative to all of the other categories that we've tested, whether it's tools, checkerboards, bodies, houses, numbers, even numbers, right? You see the extreme specialization that we're discovering with fMRI. And a surprise for us, initially, with our course tools, we thought this was a whole area. But now we see that what we thought was a single area is actually a whole galaxy of activation. I hope you can see these very small activations here. are little patches of cortex that are super specialized for recognizing written words. In the figure on the bottom, you see the actual experiment. We designed this experiment so that there was all of these different types of stimuli from real words in French or in English to approximations of words. This could be a word, but it's not. All the way down to things that could not possibly be a word. Maybe they could be a word in Czech, I'm not sure, but not even, right? Maybe in Polish or something. But they are completely impossible in French. And so we violate the statistics, and then we go to more and more closer statistics until we go all the way to real French or real English. And you can see what this does to our voxels. In the back of the brain, they're all equivalent because this is early visual cortex and they are all lines, you know, they all con constitute of little lines. But as we move forwards in these patches, we see more and more selectivity for the approximations to the actual language. And um, it means that the brain is compiling the statistics of the language that we've learned to read. And each of these patches is compiling statistics. And what we've discovered is that if you are bilingual in English and French, because they make use of the same alphabet, the same exact patches of cortex are involved. 
There are no English patches versus French patches. Everybody has the same um, resources, basically, to learn to read. But the results were slightly different when we did the same experiment in uh, English versus Chinese bilinguals. So these are people who learn to read in Chinese early and then become very fluent in reading English as well. And what we found was that still, there are many, many voxels that are in green here that are shared between English and Chinese. And you can see that they respond very strongly to English and Chinese, and they have this gradient in English and this gradient in Chinese. We designed these stimuli that are from nonsense, mixture of strokes, all the way to plausible Chinese and then to real Chinese here. And um, so using these experiments, we find that there are patches that care about reading regardless of whether it's one language or the other. But we also discovered that there are these extremely selective patches that care just about Chinese. So you see the response to Chinese here, and you see the gradient in Chinese, but not in English here. And the very surprising finding, just to show you what we can't explain, we can't explain why these patches are also responses to faces. So uh, the patches are in, are in yellow, but most of them are in orange because they overlap with the red of the response to faces. And there is something to understand here that we don't understand. I, will, I don't give you the answer because I don't know it. But the voxels that learn Chinese, they tend to care about the shapes of the faces. Maybe because Chinese characters are holistic, they care about the whole shape more than the alphabet. And so it, it shows you how when we learn to read, the new information squeezes in inside circuits that have evolved in order to recognize other objects, such as faces, tools, and so on. This is something that we have studied extensively uh, over the past 15 years. So uh, this is my own work here uh, from a science paper 2010, where we ask, well, could we make a, an entire image of the areas that have changed inside your brains because you've learned to read? How do you do that? Well, the way to do that is to compare with the brains of people who have not learned to read. So we recruited people in Brazil, in Portugal, who just didn't have the chance to go to school. Normal people with a job, everything, normal intelligence, just didn't go to school, didn't learn to read. And some of them learned to read a little bit later. So we have all this range of people. I have trouble pointing, but here we are. Uh, so we are correlating activation on the y-axis with literacy, which is the number of words you can read per minute. So all of you in this room, you are here. Okay, you can read more than 100 words per minute. The illiterates are at zero, and we have these people who learn to read only later on, okay? So they are ex-illiterate. They are never very, very good, but they learn to read a little bit, okay? And what you can see is that all the areas in color are areas that actually correlate very tightly with reading score. And what can we see here? The first thing we can see is that when you learn to read, you can access the language areas of the left hemisphere by vision. This is the main invention of reading. You don't no longer have to hear, you can just see it through your eyes. How do you do this? Well, you recycle and you change and you make selective to reading these ventral areas of the left hemisphere that I just talked about, the visual word form area, that's how we named it, uh, is an area that specializes for the shapes of letters and their statistics. We also found that there is another change, which is really striking. We didn't expect that at all. We scan these subjects also with spoken language. So now what you see here is the response to spoken sentences, spoken words, spoken pseudo words. But again, we found a very nice correlation with the reading score. And that's interesting. The, more, the better a reader you are, the more activation you have for spoken language. But because you've learned to read, you have refined these regions for spoken language. You are better able to hear the phonemes and to manipulate the phonemes. And we've also found that the connection between these two systems is enhanced, functionally and even anatomically, using diffusion tensor imaging. So we mapped the circuit for reading in this way and are able to see that it changes. Of course, we would like to do that in young children as well, and I want to say that we are able to scan young children in these magnets, not at seven Tesla yet, just because we don't have permission, but we will. So how do we school, scan school age children? You can see here the mock scanner that we have. We have a zero Tesla scanner. It's just made of wood, makes the noises and everything, but it allows us to train these children. We call them the little cosmonauts. We tell them, you are know, the pilot of a spaceship, you're going to go uh, in the spaceship. And of course, if you move, uh, the spaceship is not going to go right. So uh, you have to stay absolutely still. 
uh, we train them to click buttons and hear speech and everything and now they are ready to be scanned. And so we made several experiments of this kind, I'm just showing you one of them, where we were able to scan longitudinally the same child as the child was going through learning to read. Okay. So here we have a scan about every two months. You can see the first two scans at the beginning uh, in preschool. They are here. These two scans are in preschool. Then school starts and we have these four other scans here. And I hope you can see that as soon, as soon as school starts and the children begin to learn to read, we see the sudden activation of this reading circuitry which begins to acquire the statistics of letters and their correspondence to sound. And it's exactly at the right place from the start. It just grows slowly, right? So we can see the ventral regions here which are visual, the more lateral regions that are lexical and phonological. Um, and um, basically with such images we are able to develop a model of what it is like to learn to read and to map out the corresponding areas. I hope you can see that we start in the visual cortex. We go through this ventral visual word form area that recognizes the strings of letters and then this is broadcasted to various areas that are engaged in spoken language processing, including phonological areas in the planum temporale. So this is where we are today. We can relatively easily scan school children and from there develop an idea of uh, how they acquire a capacity such as reading. We can also simulate this. I just wanted to say there is a very nice dialogue between brain imaging and artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is beginning to model how neural networks are able to recognize a picture, for instance. So this is a model that fits relatively well with uh, the succession of visual areas that culminate in the recognition of an image, such as a face. And what we do here is we take this network and we recycle it for reading. We teach it to recognize not just pictures, but actually pictures of words, a little written word like this. And we give it a number of additional outputs these are the additional outputs which are for written words. We tell it, you know, can you recognize this word, this word, 1,000 possible words. When we do that, we find that the network simulates what we see in brain imaging. It simulates the tuning of a certain subset of units to words. So we see here the response of some of these units just to letter strings and not to all of these other categories, just like we see in brain imaging. And then we can begin to understand how written words are encoded at the neural level. In brain imaging, we still cannot see single neurons, but here we get a very strong hypothesis about how these circuits work, how single neurons are able to recognize words. And the solution is actually quite interesting. We believe that there are units, there are single neurons that are tuned to letters, so a specific letter here, but also to their position. So this unit, for instance, is responding to letter A, on the left side, position one or two. This is responding to letter R in the position just before the last. And a set of such neurons together will allow you to recognize any word, it will give you a little bit like a barcode, a series of activation like this across neurons that gives you a unique barcode for every single written word. Right. So uh, you see the state of the art now, this is this dialogue between AI for simulation, um, fMRI for recording the activation and sometimes single unit recordings when we have the chance to have a patient with an electrode in the right area and we can record a single uh, neuron. So. Okay, can we go even younger and understand where we come from? This is much more difficult but it's not impossible. Uh, this is a picture of the baby's brain, two months old babies. My wife and I were the first actually to publish a paper uh, on uh, the organization of the baby's brain for language because it's one of the most important functions. And at that time there was essentially nothing known about the cortical responses, very little known about where the activity was occurring in the child's brain. There were even some rather bizarre theories that say the brain is isotropic there's not much of a difference between auditory and visual areas. It's all going, the information is going a little bit everywhere and will have to be tuned down. And this is not at all the case. So what you see here, this is a rather interesting image. This is a baby listening in 1.5 Tesla magnet, listening to his mother tongue, speech, sentences that of course he cannot understand, 
but he already, from behavioral experiments, we know that babies at that age are already attuned to the melody of the language. And what we see in this experiment is that, in fact, the information is already going to the language areas. You can see a circuit which would, it is a bit fuzzy, of course, but not unlike what you could see in an adult, right? Broca's area and the superior temporal gyrus and superior temporal sulcus. Right? I'm not saying the baby understands the language at all, but the information is being channeled through circuits that are already highly organized, highly specific. And for instance, if you listen to music, you see more right hemisphere activation. If you listen to speech, you see more left hemisphere activation already at this age, few months old babies. What it means is that there is a lot of infrastructure in these cortical connections that is well organized and uh, that will help the development. Uh, this is exactly where the metaphor of artificial intelligence stops, right? Because artificial intelligence very often assumes completely random connections to start with, just very little architecture. Some architecture, but very disorganized. But that's not the case for the brain. The brain is highly organized right from the start. There's a lot of reproducible connections that make it a very typical sapiens brain, homo sapiens, and it's not random. And it means that the baby is prepared to learn language, just like it is prepared to use other faculties such as mathematics and so on. So this is a beautiful image from uh, not uh, our lab, but from MIT. There are several people now through the world who do images of the baby's brain. And this is a gorgeous image of uh, Rebecca Sachs, a researcher at MIT, and her baby. She went many, many times in the scanner with her baby and made this beautiful anatomical image. The image is also reminiscent of the importance of social interactions for babies. Language is already mapped onto specific circuits. The baby expects language, the baby expects social interactions. And if they do not come, then there will be enormous trouble for the developing baby. And we know that there is a critical period for language acquisition around the age of one and a half to two years of age, so very, very early. If you don't get language before that period, you are going to have lifelong difficulties in language processing because these circuits are not going to develop properly. So very, very important. Uh, this is more a message that I give to parents sometimes, but many of you will be parents. Speak to your children. Don't deprive them of this extremely important social stimulus, speech. They expect social contact, they expect eye gaze contact, and they expect dialogues. And the, and the more they get it, so you can see this image at the bottom is an image from uh, uh, the John Gabrielli lab at MIT. What they did is they took five years old and they correlated activation to spoken language with an estimation of how many dialogues the baby had, the child had, with their parents or caretakers. And this is, this is an area that has more activation with more dialogues that the, per, that the child was engaged in. Right. So dialogues have a direct effect on the activation of a broker's area in this circuit for language. OK, a third example of brain plasticity I want to give you is mathematics. Maybe some of you are learning mathematics. I hope so, right? You, you need it a little bit, I think, for medical studies. I learned a lot of mathematics, and I'm very interested in what happens in mathematicians. Why are we all able to do mathematics? Well, it turns out that uh, among the areas of the parietal lobe, you see a slice for the parietal lobe here, there is a particular region, uh, actually several regions we know now, that care about numbers and calculations. And you can see this activation in red here, in the middle of other spatial activities um, and motor activities of the parietal lobe. When you use tools, you have this activation in the front. When you move your eyes or when you move your attention, you get this activation in the posterior parietal cortex. But in the middle, you have this activation for mathematics. And it's really interesting that we, again, we all have it. It's not like we're all different from each other. We all have this activation in the back of the brain, bilateral in both hemispheres for mathematics. And uh, it is engaged every time you do even very, very simple number work, like you do two plus one, that you've just activated this area. It's, it's enough. It's already present in young children. We don't know about infants. We have just one study of infants suggesting that it's already there, especially in the right hemisphere. And the question is what happens when you develop it, when you become a professional mathematician, just like you develop reading, 
is it the case that professional mathematics develop uh, this system? So we have been studying that and showing that indeed, if you scan professional mathematicians, they have responses in the brain that are in the same place as where we all do 2 plus 2, but there they are responding to very high level mathematical concepts. So what we do here is we take either mathematics professor or we had to have controls, you know, it's not so easy. What is a control for a mathematician? So we took professors who are not good in mathematics, basically. It's a bit like the illiterate, I'm sorry to say. So we took professors in the humanities and so on that have a lot of talents and a good salary, but they don't have mathematics. And we play them sentences, short sentences. You can see here three seconds of a short statement, such as the exponential function as an asymptote at plus infinity. Okay, true or false? What do you think? Ah. <laughs> the exponential function as an asymptote at plus infinity. False. <laughs> so do you see it? The exponential function is growing like crazy, like, right? So it doesn't have an asymptote. Okay, so you are lying in a scanner, you get these very difficult questions, and you are either a professional mathematician or not. And you see that in professional mathematicians, you get this huge activation in blue, just in these areas that seem to specialize for mathematics and related uh, concepts. Whether it is in analysis, algebra, topology, geometry, relative to sentences that don't speak about mathematics. For instance, I could ask you, uh, the taxis in London are yellow. True or false? Okay. Well, you say false because they're black, right? Okay. So you've just activated your semantic network where it's not about mathematics. Then you activate the areas in green, which have to do with general semantic knowledge. And you see that again, they're bilateral, temporal pole, angular gyrus, both sides, some medial frontal activity. It's very striking that there is this division of labor inside the brain between mathematics and non-mathematics. And furthermore, the more you learn mathematics, the more you become responsive to these high level concepts that you see there is a very strong response in mathematicians, but no response at all for people who don't understand these sentences. So if you have no idea what's an exponential and an asymptote, well, you just get flat activation in these areas. Right? So again, just to show you that we can study extensively the brain plasticity and how, when we learn something, we uh, change our brains and vice versa, how the algorithms of the brain help us to learn. But that's, that would be another topic. Um, so you see, we made a discovery here as well. It's not just parietal lobe activity as well as dorsal frontal activity, just dorsal to Broca's area, but also this inferior temporal activation. And we've been studying it more and more. It's a, it's a recent discovery. And we find that there is activation there that is quite unique to mathematics. So here you see an example of the mosaic of area. Each color is a different category of visual presentation. If you present faces, you have this activation in red, for instance, a bit more in the right hemisphere. If you present, where are the words here? In pink, you see this activation in pink here, very small, related to written words, the visual word form area. Well, you see the area in uh, blue and green. This is numbers and this is uh, equations. They activate these more lateral sides for mathematics. And if you look closely, maybe you'll see that the area in green is larger in mathematicians than in other professors and also in blue. And that's what we saw, that there is more activation when you've learned more about these mathematical expressions, numbers and expressions, you have more activation there. The activation has expanded because of your expanding knowledge. Um, I am going to ask you to guess something. Um, we are scanning mathematicians. We are scanning them with all of these you know, visual presentations, checkers, faces, bodies, tools, houses, formulas, numbers, words. And there is one category which has lower activation in the mathematicians. Not higher activation, lower activation. Can you guess which one it is? You can guess. Maybe you know some mathematicians. <laughs> I should not be joking about that, but the category is faces. For faces, there is less activation in the mathematicians compared to the non-mathematicians. And it's occurring in the right hemisphere in particular. So I didn't tell you that we already found that when you learn to read, 
there is a lower activation to phases in the left hemisphere and phases grow in the right hemisphere. But when you learn mathematics on top of that, it seems that phases are suffering a bit more and there's a decrease in phase activation as there is an increase in activation to numbers and other expressions. So it's interesting, there might be a competition on the surface of the cortex. We have a fixed number of neurons, relatively almost fixed from birth. We have a fixed number of cortical neurons. They have to dedicate themselves to one domain or the other. So maybe there's a little bit of competition here. And I'm not saying this has functional consequences, but it has uh, observational consequences. Um, whether mathematicians are impaired in uh, faces, I don't know. Uh, this is, remains to be studied. Uh, there are some anecdotal reports, but we are still studying it. But at the brain level, it seems to be clear that there are changes in the organization due to the fact that we are learning one discipline or another discipline. Okay, how well am I doing? Yeah. Maybe 10 more minutes to tell you about where we are going with this uh, in terms of decoding the brain. I've shown you a number of examples where we can correlate what the person is doing. We ask her to read or to calculate and the brain activity. But you all know that if there is a correlation, it should work both ways, right? And it means that if we read the brain activity, we can to some extent determine what the person is doing. And in fact, the images I just showed you, uh, we can scan a person for reading and get about half of the variance of their reading scores, half about their reading speed, half of the variance of their reading speed from scanning their brains. So there's a lot we can tell by scanning the brain about the ongoing brain activity and about the skills of a particular person. I could tell, for instance, whether one of you have learned a certain language let's say, uh, I don't know, uh, Farsi, okay? Because if I make you listen to sentences in Farsi, I would see the brain activity and I would be able to say, oh, if there's so much brain activity, then you have learned Farsi, otherwise you don't understand it. I could tell whether you understand mathematics or not to some extent, right? So that's the question. Can we reverse the correlation and determine something about the uh, thoughts of the person? This is the first paper we did on the subject already some years ago. It was very simple. You know that there are retinotopic areas in the back of the brain, so each point on the retina maps onto a point in the cortex, in these retinotopic areas. So we thought, well, we can do exactly the reverse, right? We can determine for each point which coordinates it like, and if we see it being active, we can back project the activation, create an image of where it was, where it would have been on the screen. So that's what you see here. On the top, you see that we present um, expanded circles and we get a mapping of the cortical eccentricity on the surface of the occipital areas. And with a rotating wedge, we get a mapping of the cortical angle. And in particular, you see the contralateral activation in blue in one side, red in the other, but all of the intermediate angles are being mapped. And then we can take a new activity map, take each of these voxels, paint an image of the corresponding probable image that led to it, and decode. And you can see that it works. Here is a vision of the expanding ring, reconstituting from brain activity. And here is a vision of the rotating wedge from brain activity. Essentially, at each time, we can get a sort of vague picture of what the person had in mind, what the person was seeing. We did that with real seeing, but also in this paper, we did it with mental images. If you imagine the letter X, we can sort of see a vague X being drawn on this mental image by looking at brain activity. And other people have taken it to an extreme uh, degree of precision. This is just using retinotopy, the fact that there are retinotopic areas. But there's a lot more, right? I showed you areas that care about faces or objects. Some care about color. So what if we use all of this information and each time we have a little bit of information, we constrain the image to respect this bit of information. So people have done this, and this is from a paper in Neuron 2019, only five years ago. On top, you see the actual image. So for instance, this owl here, and this is the reconstructed image. So on top, you see a glass panel, and on the bottom, you see a sort of matrix of colors here, okay? And the fly becomes this, and I hope you can read. Can you read these letters? This is the reconstructed image from the brain activity of the letters. So I hope you can see Neuron, which was the uh, name of one of the famous journals here. 
Four years later, just last year, new papers, there's always new ones coming using AI, and this paper by Van Roelen and collaborators, you can see how good it gets. So on the left column, you see the actual image. This is what the subject was seeing inside a scanner. And from brain activity, the AI reconstructed these images. Okay. These are four different subjects. And this is what you get from the average activity of all the subjects. So I hope you can see cows. You get this image of a landscape with cows every time. Here you see a cat, I think, entering the door. And you see something that really looks a little bit like it. Maybe it's a dog, maybe it's not exactly entering the door, but it's a really very good reconstruction of what the person was seeing, right? So this is the state of the art. And uh, it keeps improving as better AI and better MRI acquisitions are coming with seven Tesla. It means that we can really sort of tell what the person was seeing from brain activity. This was the dream of the 16th century uh, engraving I showed you at the beginning. Of course, there is not just MRI, there is also dynamic imaging methods. This is MEG. I don't know if you know about it. Actually, it's a combination of MEG and this big white helmet here and EEG, electroencephalogram, in uh, these electrodes here. And we can do both. Uh, in the MEG, we have detectors of magnetic fields from the brain all around the head. And from there, we can also reconstitute brain activity, but now with a very precise dynamics, because this is really propagating at the scale of milliseconds. And so what you see here is an experiment, just to challenge a little bit what we can do. This is an experiment where we present uh, nine images per second. So you see all of these images now. With fMRI, there would be no hope of decoding what they are because they're all intermingled and fMRI is very slow. fMRI is sensitive to the bold response, which is essentially related to blood flow and blood oxygenation. So it's quite slow. It takes several seconds. Here, this is MEG. And I hope you can see that we can decode every single image that is being presented. The colors here indicate that we've decoded the first image, we've decoded the second, we've decoded the third, we've decoded the fourth, and you know, it's bodies, tools, houses, faces, much like before, but now at the scale of uh, milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. So we can see the waves of activity coming inside the brain and propagating through the brain when a picture enters the retina, goes through the salamus, goes through the cortex, goes forward into the cortex, we begin to be able to follow it. And there are very interesting problems here for those of you who are interested in research. If you look at this image, it means that, let's say, we take a particular point at 900 milliseconds and we take a vertical line here. It's just one set of data, but depending on what time point you are using to train a decoder, you can decode the image that was just presented, or the one before, or the one even before. What that means is that inside the same brain, there are several different areas that each have a different image in mind because the images are going so fast. First image, second image, third image, they're all going into a pipeline of brain activity. And it means that different areas have different information. How the brain is able to make perception out of such a big mess of propagating activation is really not understood at all. It's, a, it's like a, a chain line. If you know Charlie Chaplin in, uh, I think, uh, modern times, right? He's there every, you know, two, every uh, worker is doing something different. Well, that's a picture of the brain. Every worker, every different brain area is doing something different with a different image. But how this whole activity gets coordinated so that we perceive a homogeneous field so you perceive my voice and seeing me at the same time, even though they are reaching at different times inside your brain, these sort of problems are not solved. And just to uh, finish, uh, decoding is also possible for speech in uh, MEG. And this is a really exciting paper from Jean-Rémy King and his team just last year, showing that even in single subjects, listening to a single story, you can decode the words that they have been exposed to. And uh, you get some idea, at least in some subjects, the first word that is being decoded is the right one. So this was, the person was really listening to thank you for coming, Ed, and that's what the decoder has been reconstituting. So by combining brain imaging with AI, we really get a long way towards being able to decode uh, the human brain. Now, where are we going? Several interesting leads. First, maybe you guys will be using this machine. MRI is not necessarily 100 tons. 
This is a 500 kilo machine, and there will be several like these, which are going ultra low field rather than ultra high field. And with just a few uh, milli Teslas, you can still get some image of the brain, not perfect, but I think you are the neurologist, I'm not. You can use some of these images to diagnose and uh, to use in medicine and maybe democratize MRI. So I think in just the space of a few years, we will have several brands of machines that are extremely cheap, only a few hundred thousands of euros that are cheap enough to be available in uh, several hospitals, doctors, portable, uh, because they are uh, ultra low field and can be plugged in the wall. Um, another thing which is coming is I've told you about the reading out from brain activity, but can we write brain activity? It's working in both directions. And there are some papers that are already coming out to create these bidirectional links. This is a science paper from Peter Rufsemer's team. Very, very impressive work. Uh, this is, of course, in a monkey, not yet in a human, but you know there, are, there is already several patients that are being imp implanted by these uh, Utah arrays in order to create a bidirectional link with their brains. So you see here this Utah array, which is a 10 by 10 array of electrodes, which is being inserted inside the cortex and can record and stimulate. Here there were, uh, I think there was 16 arrays of 8 by 8 that were being implanted for a total of 1,024 electrodes. And of course, it's in the visual cortex of the monkey. So each point here, uh, each electrode corresponds to a particular spot in the retinotopic cortex. And if you stimulate, it will evoke a dot of light, a phosphine. You stimulate and the person says, if it is a human, oh, I see a little spot of light. Here the monkey, the monkey cannot speak, but they asked, can you make an eye movement to where the light was? And by mapping the eye movements, they were able to get all of these little dots. Sorry for that. So each of the green dots here is one electrode and the proposed location where it corresponds on the retinotopic map. Okay? I hope you are following me. After you've mapped this, you can stimulate maybe 16 of these electrodes and stimulate them to make a little O. Okay? And the monkey has been trained with real stimuli to map these letters onto these locations. If it's an O, move to the right. If it's A, move to the top. T to the left. L to the bottom. And the first time the monkey is stimulated with the electrodes is that from a little O, he does a saccade to the O. And then if it was an L, he moved to the bottom and so on. So here is the first time, I think, that a high capacity visual communication was established from the outside by painting a letter onto the cortex of the monkey and showing that the monkey was actually perceiving the corresponding letter that he was seeing treating it as seeing by stimulation. So, of course, here in neurology, I don't have to tell you how important these things are. There are already several brain-computer interfaces in order to relieve patients from their paralysis, to command a robot, to command a, a body, an artificial body. Uh, but it is also going to be possible to write in the opposite direction to uh, relieve people from their blindness, for instance. Uh, either with artificial retinas or like here directly by stimulating inside the cortex or stimulating inside the salamus. And uh, in this way, uh, we hope that there will be compensation for several of the neurological diseases and in this case, including blindness. So that's the end of my talk. This is actually my brain uh, photographed uh, several years ago, 3D reconstructed. I have a 3D print of my brain in my office. It's nice. It's like it's like Hamlet, right? <laughs> well, that's what I would like you to think about a little bit, right? I, I think that this is me, basically. Inside there is me, um, all my personality, all my capacities. We begin to be able to read them out. We're quite far from understanding how this works, but I have very little doubt that this machine has all of my uh, capacities and knowledge and emotions. That's where it's coming from. This is difficult to come to grips with, right? But, so the French version of my book is not called Seeing the Mind, it's called Face to Face with Your Brain. Because I'm trying to say, well, all that you saw today is going on inside your brain. It was going on, it could have been your brain, right? Okay. So think about it, right? That's, that's where it's taking place. That's all that I've shown you today, all of the beauty is actually what is going on, what allows you to have all of these wonderful capacities as students. Um, 
it's a little humbling message. I think that I don't think there is anything else than just being this beautiful machine, but it's an incredibly beautiful machine. It's a wonderful, organized, superb machine. There is no equal at the moment, although we've made some comparisons with AI. Uh, there is no machine that comes near uh, the beauty and the capacity of this machine. And I think we just have to accept that as well. I, I, you know that there is a very uh, long quest in philosophy, which is know thyself. Try to know thyself. I think that's what we are trying to do with these images. We're trying to understand who we are. And uh, we are quite far from going very deep, but we still see some of the superficial capacities in some detail. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and maybe you have some questions. Thank you. Thank you.